All right, good evening everybody. It's been a little while since we've been together for uh, a Wednesday night Bible study. I appreciate your patience along the way. And uh, do we, I, I see most of you have already found your forever home, your, your forever seats. Do we have anybody new with us for the first time in Bible study tonight? All right, yeah, good. We got some over there, yeah. Yeah, Eric and Brian and yeah, good, good deal. Well, everybody that's around somebody that raised their hand, you have to be extra nice to them. Um, if you didn't get signed in, we, don't, we didn't do a sign up ahead of time. Um, we'll put all of your names and emails into um, our system for the Bible study so that should something come up and I'm not able to be here or we're not going to be able to have it, we can email you ahead of time and let you know. Um, the other thing that we try to do and uh, sorry for those of you who need it on a regular basis. I need a reminder on a regular basis that you still need the outline. Um, if you can't make it on a Wednesday night, email me on Thursday and I'll send you the one with the answers. <laughs> um, the, the other option is we do have it posted online. Uh, Mike was saying usually by Monday of the following week, it should be up online. So if you prefer to watch it and watch the video, you can go to our website. I think it's off the hub and look for Bible studies and you should be able to find it there. All right, um, we got a couple of housekeeping rules. And the first one is before you come to Bible study, pray, okay? And honestly, when it comes to interpretation, then we have to have the Lord's help. Um, some, some of you grew up in church, uh, but you never really have had a personal devotional or reading time or been part of a Bible study. Um, through a misunderstanding when I was 13 years old, I stopped reading the Bible because I didn't think I could be good enough for God. Um, it was a direct reading, and yet it was an incorrect reading. And that's why I always stress about knowing the context. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight, uh, that there are people who walk away from the faith because they don't like what they read. But the problem is um, they get angry with God when God says, hey, you're not really understanding what you're reading. And so don't blame me for your misunderstanding. Um, so my first rule is talk to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to open your eyes and then um, read each week's study ahead of time. Um, we were asking last time what kind of study did we want to do and uh, we did have a couple of ideas but then uh, several people said well really we'd like to study the passage that we're going to be doing on Sunday. And um, I didn't know if that would be too repetitious or people would think it was boring. Uh, but a lot of people said, no, I think it'll help me listen better on Sunday. Um, and there are some times, because uh, I do want to keep going through the Bible chapter by chapter. But if we went verse by verse, uh, we'd never get out of Matthew. Um, so we're doing a chapter a week, which means on Sunday, I can't cover everything though many of you know I try. <laughs> um, you know, so we are going to do a little bit more of a deep dive. Uh, this is pretty much me talking and giving you my thoughts and ideas. I have the inability to follow anybody else's study. So I have to do my own study in my own head. And then when I have questions, I have to go study those questions. And then sometimes I share them with you and my, what the results I found. I may not be able to get to everybody's, but hopefully by the time we get finished, um, you'll have a better understanding. And then I've always encouraged people to read the passage ahead of time. That's 20 years ago, I started sending out sermon enhancers. And because I, I, I've always encouraged people, the more you read, the better I sound, right? The, the more you hear it and repetition and sinking into the brain, into the heart, the more it's going to make sense along the way. 
Uh, so I hope this will be helpful. So pray, ask for the Holy Spirit's leading and guidance, um, read each week's study ahead of time, show up early. Um, I'm gonna guess we have around 70 here tonight. Uh, last time we had upwards of 100 people sometimes. And if you didn't get here early, you didn't get your seat. Um, so just encourage you to, to be here, be on time, and be uh, ready for it. And then number four is be nice. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to tell Christians to be nice? Um, but sometimes when it comes to theological debates, when it comes to, well, my way or highway, uh, when it comes to, well, we just disagree, um, somehow many of us cannot disagree without being, as my aunt from the South says, ugly. And um, we live in a culture today that is the cancel culture. And if you don't agree with me and you don't agree with culture, then you're mean-spirited, you're bigoted, and you should be canceled. And a lot of people have lost their jobs, a lot of public figures uh, on news and radio uh, for just being honest and being who they were, but because it went against the grain, um, they were canceled for it. But it seems we live in an angry generation. And everybody is so sure, and everybody wants tolerance for their views. They don't want to give tolerance to anybody else. And so um, I, uh, we had a great answer from uh, last week's sermon as we were here in the fellowship time. I, I said, uh, there was somebody in the choir, and I said, oh, yeah, good to see you up there in the loft again. And he got up and shook my hand and said, let me introduce myself. I'm a Calminian. Okay, that was funny, people. <laughs> because I was trying to walk the tightrope line between Calvinist and Arminian and, you know. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, now, when you explain it, it's not nearly as funny, you know. Um, and, and, and the idea I was trying to say, you know, here's where I am, here's why I'm here, but you know what? There's a lot of intelligent people who come down differently about that. I don't know why. I always say Tim Keller, um, who has now passed away from cancer, he was one of my favorite teachers of all time. Um, I just couldn't understand why he was a Presbyterian. I was like, come on, you're a smart dude, I don't know. Um, but the fact is, there's good reasons uh, for people to believe on different sides. And they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, I think it was Wesley and Whitfield, and I've gotten confused in the story now which one was which, but somebody asked if they would see the other in heaven, and they said, oh no, I'm afraid not, which made you think, uh-huh, you know, see, you just sure you're right, yeah. and he says, for he will be so far up to the throne of God that I will not be able to see him. It was an incredible statement of humility and appreciation for somebody in certain areas. They actually had some vehement disagreements and uh, Whitfield had actually asked Wesley to stop preaching on some of the doctrines. And uh, for being five foot two, Wesley was kind of fiery. And it's like, yeah, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> so if you don't wanna hear it, don't invite me to your church, but I'm gonna keep preaching it. Um, but the idea is they were really, really good contemporaries and good friends. And they just said, okay, I see it differently. So we wanted to leave room uh, for people to, to think. But remember, if somebody disagrees with you, you don't know the background, you don't know what they've studied, you don't know what they were taught. Some people, um, they'll tell me, well, I just can't get over it. I was taught this since I was a child. And even if I wanted to, I don't think I can. I'm stuck. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. Um, but you can still be nice and be nice to somebody who disagrees with you. Okay, well, let's open up. Uh, anybody have any questions as we get started here? Okay, we are jumping in in the middle since uh, we're picking up now um, with uh, chapter 10 is where we're gonna be. So. Um, I want to also encourage you to bring your Bibles every week. 
As you're reading in your Bibles, I always encourage people, you can color in them. Um, you can use highlighters, you can use ink pens, you can use pencils, and do whatever it takes. Um, if something really stands out to me, if I have a highlighter, I'll highlight it. And what's fascinating is years later, I'll come over that passage and it jumps out at me again. And I'm like, when did God put that verse in there? And then I'm like, well, he apparently it was in there last time because I highlighted it last time, but it's still jumping out at me. So you, you can do that. Sometimes you can put question marks, go like, what the heck is he talking about? And um, I will say that there are some historical things. There's some theological things. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about hermeneutics or um, exegesis tonight. Uh, big words that you can look up later. Um, but anyway, how we come and approach um, the study of God's word and how we could determine um, what he's really uh, trying to get across and say. So let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this night. We thank you. Uh, many people have been looking forward to this Bible study. And Lord, we just pray that as we open up the doors, you'll just send more and more people our way, people who are hungry to learn. I ask as a, a humble servant uh, that you would lead me and guide me each week as I dig in and still have many questions myself. Uh, but Lord, always with the help of your Holy Spirit, keep bringing us back to not what we think, uh, but what you think. And I pray that we would all be able to have open eyes and open ears and open hearts. And they would, we would see uh, with our hearts that we would believe and find true faith in you. So Lord, we pray that you'd be with us tonight and uh, open our eyes as we open your word. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody in the Lord said, Amen. Amen. All right, so we're gonna be in Romans chapter 10. Um, it's page 1,621 in my Bible. <laughs> Don't know if that helps you a lot. The other question is what, what version do I use? And usually on Sunday morning, which is the same Bible I use, it's the NIV Bible. Um, honestly, any English translation is gonna be about 97, 98% correct. And um, I do have some things that I wish that they had corrected. I mentioned some last week. <laughs> it's like, well, why didn't they just say that? Um, but anyway, we use the NIV, so I know some people, if they don't have the exact version, they struggle with it. I also encourage, um, uh, certainly if you have access to them, commentaries. Um, Miss Lois down here, wave your hand, is, uh, going to be helping in our library and we have a lot of commentary so um, after church on Sunday is you know when she'll be in there and um, you can take a look at some of those things uh, but also uh, an easy one is to get a, a study Bible and um, the first time that I really read through the Bible all the way by myself uh, actually the first one I did it was a devotional Bible and uh, when you're in numbers and you know Deuteronomy and it's like oh my why am I here and what name I can't pronounce and what land I can't pronounce and I'm trying hard to care why are they here and then there'd be a devotion and said this is where God spoke to me about this passage and I go oh okay um, I guess there was some value in that but it also kept me going you know, week after week, devotion after, and I would just re read from devotion to devotion, whether it was three pages or four pages or whatever. So that was the men's NIV, uh, devotional Bible, I think 1984 uh, was the one that I used. Uh, but then got a uh, NIV study Bible. And so as I was rereading again through the, the scripture, and I would say, what the heck did I just read? Why is this here? I could look down, and I don't know if you're like me, uh, I used to be one of those kids that looked for the cliff notes. Why, why read the whole thing if you can just jump straight to the cliff notes? But I tried to discipline myself to read the word, try to understand it, but then sometimes I'd still be lost and I could look down at the notes and they're there, they're there for a reason. And they actually make a lot of sense. And they help you historically or theologically or scripturally 
uh, to make more sense of that. And the more we read it, the more we do it, the more we study, the more sense it makes, and the more God's word gets hidden in our hearts. Amen? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, we do have some Bibles available if somebody wants to come into the library. Okay. Sunday or two, uh, Tuesday mornings. And they're welcome to look through the Bibles and see what we have. Some of them were donated. Some are brand new. Okay. Are you giving them away? or yeah. Or they're, okay. Well, there's no reason for them not to to be used sure absolutely she's just offering that uh, people have donated bibles over the years and so if you want to come and look at different you know uh, versions and see which one you like or and uh, there's some things we'd like you to not walk away with uh, but there are some things there that are are meant to be used and so if you don't have one or you would need one or you would like one of a different version uh, just check with Lori and see if we have an extra one in our in our um, uh, library and we'll be glad to get that to you. And if for some reason, if you can't afford one, talk to me and I will get you one, okay? One that's never been colored in before. Uh, but many of you have these pristine Bibles at home. Maybe they've been family heirlooms and they've never been opened before. Uh, it's okay. It's okay to write in your Bible. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. It's God's word. I was like, no, he wants you to use it. He wants you to open it. And I, when I was in seminary, I would take notes. Whatever sermon was being given about a particular passage, I would write all over the margins and everything else. And again, it helped me make sense of you know God's word. All right, let's take a look. Romans chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Just a quick background, if you don't know this, the Apostle Paul was a very learned scholar. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He um, acted righteously according to the law. And, um, but he, he was also so zealous for God of their religion that when Christ was standing in front of him, he could not recognize him. He could not see him. And so therefore he persecuted Jesus. He persecuted the early church and the followers, uh, putting some in prison, torturing others and putting some to death and smiling as it was happening. And then if you don't know the story, God, Jesus got a hold of him and said, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And um, the scales fell off of his eyes. He learned that it was Jesus and he became a zealous follower of Jesus. So this is Paul, who's now a follower of Jesus and who is you know, writing to the Roman church. But he's, he's talking about his brothers and sisters um, of the Jewish heritage and faith. And many of them, we, we know Pentecost, 3,000 of the people in Jerusalem became instant Christians. The problem is there was probably, you know, I, I've heard numbers, one to three million people that had descended, um, you know, for um, the Sabbath. Uh, they had descended there for the Passover. And so while 3,000 sounds like a lot, and any, most churches would like to have 3,000 people. Um, there were millions who heard them preaching and did not believe. And so he's writing about his heart uh, to save his own flesh and blood, his own family, his own friends, his own heritage. And <laughs> we're going to talk about it a little bit. Because some people not studied Christians but some people think well all you have to do is be sincere well the Jews were more sincere than anybody else they were actually trying to bring the kingdom of God here to earth if they could just get everybody to act right then God would be pleased and he would be glad to be with his people again so they were very zealous they were very sincere but you can still be sincere and go to hell. Okay? So 
This is why he's praying for them and encouraged, you know, for them. Verse 3, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. If you're using a highlighter, that's a good one to highlight. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who, what? Believes, okay? Uh, Verse five, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. And that is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him. How many people? Yeah, Uh, sorry, that was a confusing question. Yeah, since the answer is anyone, that may not be grammatically correct, but you get the idea, which is why I had you said it. Anyone, everyone, all y'all, all us. Anyone um, who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference. Um, Just a point of reminder here. In the early church, you had Jews and Gentiles. And they had very different thoughts, very different cultures, very different beliefs. And honestly, the Jews thought they were better than everybody else and they were the chosen people of God. And so they were probably a little bit snooty and looking down on the Gentiles and what are they even doing here? But now he's bringing peace between them by saying, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right. Let's take a look at our outline. Um, uh, Here's my introduction. I forgot to read. Uh, Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, to the Christian church in Rome around 57 AD. He was on his way back to Jerusalem with a collection uh, for the poor and wrote this letter with hopes of visiting them in person soon. Now, why is it important that we have the dates of when these uh, writers were writing? Um, When they were actually putting the Bible together, they had a lot of letters from a lot of different people but they weren't putting it really all together until around 300 AD. So anybody remember about what year was Christ crucified? 33 AD. Could have been 34 and a half, we're not exactly sure, but somewhere about 33 AD. And part of the way they decided which letters got included in our Bible today is they had to know who the author was and they had to know about what time they were writing. Um, I've shared this many times. Some of you grew up in Roman Catholic um, backgrounds and churches and the Roman Catholic Bible actually has many extra books that did not make it into the Protestant Bible. And the reason the Protestants did not accept them is because either they did not know who the author was or some of them were written one to 200 years after. And the third reason was some of them actually teach uh, contradictory uh, doctrines that um, the rest of the Bible. So they were looking for, (laughs) if you're gonna get somebody's opinion do you want to get it when it's fresh or do you want to get it when it's been handed down you know through a couple of generations no you want to get to the eyewitness and so that's why it's important that we understand it was around 57 AD I fully believe 
that the disciples thought Jesus was coming back any second now. They were looking for his immediate return. And again, there was no printing press back then. Uh, so only the temple, uh, only the rabbis would have the scrolls, the word of God. Uh, and remember, only the Old Testament would have been around back then. And then these new letters after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that were being uh, circulated. Okay. All right, uh, so the church in Rome was not started by Paul. He started, he was a missionary. He started a lot of churches, but he had never been to Rome at the point of writing his letter. Many of you know he ended up in Rome after being imprisoned and uh, appealing to Caesar. And remember, the, the, uh, Rome was the center of the world. <laughs> all, lo all roads lead to Rome. And so... Boy, if he ever had a, a platform to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, he wanted to get to Rome. He really believed that he could make a difference uh, by getting there. So he wrote this letter, um, and, and our, the church was not started by Paul. I'm about halfway down the introduction there. But by those who'd been in Jerusalem during Pentecost. If you read in Acts about Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit, the disciples had gathered in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they got up and they started preaching to the crowd uh, that had gathered below. And many of them were astonished because these uneducated fishermen and tax collectors were preaching in languages that they knew mm -hmm. and they knew there was no way that they knew, right? So they're preaching in languages and they're hearing the gospel um, some have called it um, Babylon reversed <laughs> because at Babylon they scat God scattered them and confused that's the word Babel means to speak in confused language so Babylon is where we get this from but this was the reversal of Babylon and instead of being confused the people could hear in their own language the good news and the gospel of Christ. So these people who heard, who were there um, uh, for um, the Passover, would have then returned back home, many of them back home to Rome, and when they got to Rome, they would have started house churches back then. Uh, so Paul was always eager to preach the gospel and help the disciple, those new in the faith. The church was composed of Jews and Gentiles with very different starting points, very different lifestyles. He wrote this letter to correct false doctrines and to teach the new Christian Jews and Gentiles the correct way to salvation. So that's the whole premise for uh, Paul writing this letter. If many of you don't know, um, we have a fancy church word for it called the epistle which means letter. So we should just say letter. And uh, most of the New Testament are really just letters teaching us about Jesus Christ, okay? All right, so number one, um, Paul follows chapter nine by explaining that many of the Jews have missed salvation. He explains that even though they pursued God with zeal, they pursued him falsely through the law. And so I put it in parentheses there. One can be sincere and be wrong. Some of you have heard that. Well, there's so many gods, and if God knows everything and he cares about everything, then all you have to do is be good and be sincere, and God will surely save you. And that is a false doctrine. It smells like smoke comes straight from the pit of hell. There is only one way to be saved, and that through calling on the name of Jesus Christ which we will talk later. So it's not, it's not enough to be good, it's not enough to be sincere. Uh, Paul explains that their zeal was based on knowledge, was not based on knowledge. Um, since they had the law, this indicates they lacked a spiritual knowledge. So obviously they had knowledge about God, they had knowledge of you know, the, the Old Testament they would have had and known and uh, heard by heart and known all the people and all the stories and and all the teachings that it would have been there So they had knowledge of a certain 
uh, maybe historical knowledge, if you will. Um, but Paul says they did not have knowledge, and that indicates that this kind of knowledge was a spiritual knowledge which they lacked. Um, and spiritual knowledge can only come by faith. That's your first fill in the blank, is faith, F-A-I-T-H. And by the way, I make all these up, and I was tempted to underline that one everywhere all, all along these. I, I did do a few others, but you know, faith needs to be underscored there. Um, and if you can't spell it, it's F-A-I-T-H. In 1 Corinthians 18, Paul elaborates that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Um, they can't see, meaning they can't understand, because they lack faith. Uh, Paul's message is that salvation is a matter of faith. Abraham, though he did not have uh, the law, so Abraham preceded Moses. Moses was the one that God gave the law. So Abraham wouldn't have known the moral code. How, how am I supposed to live? He talked to God directly. And God directly talked to him. Um, but he didn't know the law. And he didn't know about Jesus. And yet, if you read in Hebrews 11, uh, which we call the Hall of Faith, um, he talks about the author of Hebrews, some believe it was Paul, um, that many of them, their faith, it was credited to them as righteousness. So for people who have all these questions, what about the people who came before Jesus? Are they all in hell? Because they wouldn't have known Jesus. And they're like, no. They were able to see and hear from God. In fact, if you're angry about the angry God that seems to unmercifully just kill certain people and go in for genocide and all that, you will actually learn historically that God had given them opportunity time and time again before the Israelites went in and took Israel. Um, God had spoken to the people, but they did not turn from their ways. They did not follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so finally God put an end to them and blessed his people by giving them, you know, the special land. Okay, so it's through faith that we're saved and that's how they were saved in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. While the law is good, it is helpless to bring uh, God's plan, uh, it's, it's, it's helpless to bring salvation for no one can keep it perfectly. Um, you know, we have a saying in the church that says, if you break one, you break them all. You know, if you're guilty once, you're guilty of them all. Um, it actually reveals our imperfection and therefore our need for a savior. I want to call your attention back to the scripture and remember the one that I said you could highlight where Jesus is the culmination of the law. The law was given so that we would know the difference between right and wrong. That moral law, we are still beholden to. It's not that the law is bad, but the law was given to show us right from wrong, but also to show us our inability to keep it perfectly because we all are born with a sin gene. We all wanna do what we wanna do and not what God wants us to do. We want people to follow us and us not to follow anybody else. Um, so uh, it's important that we understand that Jesus is the culmination of the law. So the law pointed toward salvation, but it also let people know that they needed something else, needed a savior. God's plan, last line there, number one, is of mercy and grace. Do not fall for it when people say, well, the God of the Old Testament's an angry God. There does seem to be some angry passages in there. And guess what? The Bible tells us God gets angry. But there's a holy and a righteous anger. Um, but everywhere along the way, it shows that he's a God of mercy. The Bible is consistent, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and helps us understand the nature of God. So don't repeat it if you've ever said it. And um, don't believe it if somebody else says it, that, you know, there's an angry God and a lovey-dovey God, and we're just going to follow the lovey-dovey God. Nope. Same God. Holy, righteous, but loving and merciful. All right, number two. 
Paul also expounds on what we call today works righteousness. All other religions believe salvation comes by being good, attempting to climb the religious mountain uh, through good works. We talked a little bit about this last Sunday. Um, any other religion is about us climbing up to the great and highly high, you know, whoever God of your choice is. Um, it is only Christianity um, where God comes down the mountain to us in, in grace. Okay, so salvation doesn't come uh, by us being good. It's uh, through, you know, faith uh, uh, and grace alone. All right, uh, many, including uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, anybody ever have one knock on your door? Okay. Um, if not, um, they're out and about. I'll send them your way. Um, and, and they seem to be good, well-mannered, very nice people. Be nice to them. There's good reason why they believe what they believe, but I'm going to tell you right now, they believe a false doctrine. They know more about um, the basic commentaries, like the lighthouse, uh, their leaders have written commentaries to explain everything. The problem is they didn't get it right. Um, they did not have proper education in Greek and grammar. And so therefore they have some really poor understandings. Um, the Mormons, the same thing. I, I try to be kind. Um, because there's a lot of Mormons that are a lot of really super nice people. They're all about family. And they seem to present, and everybody goes, well, it's just a different brand of Christianity. No, it's not. It's not like Presbyterian and Methodist and Baptist and all that. You know, all of those are of the same teaching about Jesus Christ. These have a different perspective of salvation. The reason we're not knocking on doors and they are is because they're trying to earn enough brownie points to get into heaven. And if you ever want to have a conversation with them, um, one of the questions you can ask them said, okay, you know, I go to church and um, you obviously seem to be a, a very nice person and you have the Bible and you're reading, but can you tell me how your church teaches us that we can be saved? And they'll probably start stammering and saying, well, it's up to us once we've been saved that we go out and do good work so that we can be good enough. Um, some of these religions even teach that you can get so high by doing so many good things that you be can become a god yourself. There's not one god, there are many gods. And that if you're good enough and you study enough and you knock on enough doors and you go to enough islands, and if you work hard enough, then you can become a god too. That, um, well-meaning, hear me say that. These are really nice people, these are really good people, but they're really confused. And they have some, some poor teaching um, in their background. Um, and and the, my, my Greek professor uh, chased some of them down the street because he, they said, well, if you really understood the Greek. He's like, yes, come on in. Let's talk about it. Here's my Greek Bible right here, and I can explain that passage to you. And they ran away because they, they, they could not stand up against um, the true understanding from the Greek. Okay? Um, but I wanted you to hear that Christianity is the only religion in the world that is based on grace. Everybody else is about works righteousness, and it's actually the downfall of the Jews who were trying to earn salvation by being good enough. We, on the other hand, do good works because we are saved, because of God's grace. Good works follows salvation, not is an attempt on our part to earn it, okay? Um, yeah, so uh, how do we find salvation about the middle of that? Paragraph number two, uh, their answer like the Jews is through works, where a scripture is clear, it is by grace, that's your first, or your fill in the blank there in a number two, through faith. I told you you're going to see that one a lot. Grace through faith, because it's important doctrine. It's not by works that we are saved. 
It's not by being good that we are being saved. It's not by uh, being sincere that we are being saved. I will tell you the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are some of the sincerest people I've ever met. Really good, lovely people. They've just gotten, they hitched their wagon uh, to you know a confusing doctrine um, that I'm afraid leads them away from Christ, no matter how good they are or how sincere they are. Grace through faith alone, and if you want to look that up, it's in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Paul's argument about bringing Christ down, so I thought I'd go ahead and explain a little bit about this, because you're like, why are we bringing him down, or why are we bringing him up, and what are they trying to say by that? Paul's argument about bringing Christ down, or to bring Christ up, is all about the arrogance of works. That if we're good enough, God will be obliged to give us salvation, as if God owes us something. Um, God owes us nothing. We've all sinned. Uh, we cannot force our way to God, but we can and must. That's your imperative for the night. Must. M-U-S-T. Must accept His grace through our faith. Okay? Only one, one way to be saved, one name by which we can be saved, and that is by, uh, through God's grace and our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We must accept him. Though we cannot ascend to him in mercy, he has come to us. In verse 9, Paul explains that if we declare with our mouths, Jesus is Lord, which that is um, an early Christian creed. Um, creed is um, uh, the Latin word, creer. Uh, and I, sometimes I get my Spanish and my Greek and my Latin mixed up a little bit. Um, but it, it basically means a belief. Um, so creed, like if you think about the Apostles' Creed, what are the first two words? I believe. So when you're reciting a creed, you're saying, this is what I believe. All right? And this one is one of the earliest Christian creeds, and one of the shortest too, to say that Jesus is Lord. Now, there's a whole lot of depth that's going into that, saying not because there's a, okay, uh, Islam uh, reveres Jesus very much. They are very good people. They are very sincere people, most of them anyway. Um, and they respect the heck out of Jesus. They just don't think he's God. They think he's a super prophet of God, but he is not God. When the early Christians said Jesus is Lord, they're saying Jesus is God. Okay? Not I'm trying not to get into the Trinity too much there, but that's the same thing. In fact, that's why Jesus was crucified, because he claimed to be God. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Father and I are one. And so um, this was one of the earliest creeds, uh, Kyrios Yesu, if you want to look it up. Um, and believe, that last line, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. So, if there's no resurrection, then our faith is futile. Um, God overcame death in Jesus Christ. He took our sin to the grave, but he didn't stay there. He was raised again, and so it's important. That's why I put... That's that fill in blank there. Raised him from the dead. You must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we will be saved. By the way, for those who keep fearing death, um, we prolong it. We put it off as long as possible. Um, you know what? Honestly, uh, if you really believe and you have a hunger and thirst, um, then it doesn't matter how long we live here. The psalmist says, our, our life is but a blade of grass. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. It goes like this. Um, and so, if you want a John Wayne quote, you know, everybody gonna die is just a matter of how and when. You know, so it's, it's gonna happen sometime, but it's not something we should be afraid of. And um, the reason we don't fear it is because Jesus was the first one to be resurrected. Don't count Lazarus in there, it's completely different. But Jesus was the first one to be resurrected in his eternal body. 
Lazarus is not still hanging around, okay? That was a whole temporary thing. He doesn't have his complete new body yet, uh, nor do we. But we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we're going to be raised again. We're going to get new bodies, bodies that won't grow old, bodies that won't get tired, bodies that won't want to sin anymore. So it's, it's important that we understand um, the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. All right, number three, in uh, verses 12 and 13, Paul levels the playing field. Uh, when it comes to salvation, it's not about birth, B-I-R-T-H, Gentile or Jew. Remember before Abraham, there was only Gentiles. Everybody in the world was a Gentile, okay? But with Abraham, God started a whole new race. And that was the Hebrew people, um, also known as the Jews. Fun fact is they, they've done the testing or uh, forensics to go back and try to understand where the name Hebrew came from. And uh, at least according to my professors, and I have no reason to doubt them, um, it's very similar to another Hebrew word Apiru, Hebrew, Apiru, A-P-I-R-U, in case you want to look it up. Um, but Apiru is a wanderer. Remember, Abraham did not have a home. He was called to leave his home, and God said, I'm going to get you a new home. Abraham says, great, where? They're like, just follow me. I'll let you know when we get there. Okay? Uh, so that's a fun fact. But the other fun fact is, Prior to Abraham, everybody was considered a Gentile. But when Abraham started this new race, it was the, the Jews or the Hebrew uh, people, all right? But um, they, they had a little bit of an arrogance issue because they lorded it over everybody else that God loves us best and he doesn't love you. Nana, nana, boo, boo. But if you go back to the promise of Abraham, or Abram at the time, he said, I will make you the father of many nations and and you will be a light unto the Gentiles. So this was God's plan from the very beginning. Somebody says, why didn't he start with the biggest group of people and the biggest army? Well, if the biggest army takes over the world, you kind of go, eh, they got more soldiers, more power than anything else but he started with the smallest. And so then, and then, and only then can you say, it's God who did this. Not these little people took over the world. We're talking about it today, thousands of years later. And I think it's because God gets the glory that way. All right, any questions on that first half? Okay, I'm aware of the time. Um, let's go on to Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through uh, 21. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Qu consequently, faith, here's another highlighter if you want. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Um, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words uh, to the ends of the world. And again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by, all, by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I found by those who did not seek me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. All right, so once again, Paul's begging the question, well, if the Israelites 
are the one that the Messiah came through, then obviously they should all believe. Well, why did they believe? Should we blame God for that? He goes like, no way. They didn't believe because they had hard-headed hearts and, and hard heads. They, they just refused to believe. But it's not that God failed. God offers His grace to anybody, to everybody. But not everybody will hear it. Not everybody will um, accept it. All right, number four. In this passage, Paul lists four things that need to happen in order for someone to be saved. Someone has to be sent. And in case, you know, you've heard these words like the Apostle Paul, the difference between a, dis a disciple and an apostle. A disciple is one who sits under a teaching. They're students. But the disciples became apostles when they went out. They took the good news out into the world. The apostle Paul literally took the message to the Gentiles out in the world. And so the word apostle is a sent one. So someone has to be sent. They need uh, to preach the word. <laughs> this is no joke. I was once told by a parishioner in this church, <laughs> Church would be much better if I didn't speak. Yeah. They just said, people just love to hear our choir. And if you would just not talk, then we would all have a much better time. And um, my dear loving wife was standing behind me. And I did not have to look. I could feel the heat and the embers and the, the smoke rising. And uh, the person speaking looked at her and then looked at me and said, well... Okay, once a month. You can just do a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was told 20 years ago that the spoken word would be out of vogue by now. Well, not in my world. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm going to say it will never go out of style because God says in order for somebody to believe, somebody has to be sent. And they have to preach the gospel. They have to preach his word. They should not be out preaching their words. They should be out preaching his word. That's why every pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist must study the word to make sure they're not giving their thoughts and opinions, but giving God's word so that people can understand a correct view of, of God. All right. Um, number three, people must hear. And when I say active listening, because he even begs the question with Isaiah, well, didn't they hear? Well, obviously they did. Um, <laughs> if you've ever been a school teacher before, then you know the students who are listening and those who are listening. Um, and, and there's an active listening where you're actually listening to, to hear and to learn and to you know, absorb. So people must hear it. And then number four, they must believe. And I would say for the Israelites, they had three out of four of these things because the, the gospel came to them first. And but because they rejected it, it was then taken unto the Gentiles. Um, and so they had the first three, but they did not believe. Uh, they were so sure that they were right. Um, have you ever heard the saying, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's already made up, right? Um, or some people's brains are like cement. Uh, they're, they're, <laughs> um, they're all mixed up and, and permanently set. You know, so they are not humble enough to be able to, to learn and to hear. All right? um, so uh, they must believe. So again, number four, they must believe. It's still amazing to me that God uses imperfect people, and I'll say like me, to speak his perfect word. Uh, there is a joke that goes along with this and so when Jesus returned to heaven and the angel and it's a joke people it's not in the Bible anywhere don't look for it um, and, but you can just imagine so how did it go on earth well I thought it was pretty good how many followers did you have 12 12 what are you gonna do now and what's what's the plan to go from here well 
They're going to take the message out into the world. Hmm. What's plan B? <laughs> That's funny, people. Come on. Um, you know, you left it with 12, well, really 11 at that point. Uh, uh, 11 imperfect men. Is there any other way? Is there something more to it? Which they would never have asked that because they're part of sharing the gospel uh, as well. Um, angels are real if you don't know that. Okay? Um, so the joke failed. Move on. Even more amazing that some people hear and come to faith from all of us imperfect pastors. Uh, when I think of some of my early sermons, I went, wow, God is good. He's, you know, he's graceful. Um, yeah, but all four must be accomplished in order for a person to be saved. All by God's amazing grace. That's why I have a share every week. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Okay. Number five, in verse 15, he quotes from Isaiah, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It's important when exegeting a passage. Um, I'm actually smarter than my computer because I didn't know, know that that was a word. And it actually is. comes from the word exegesis, E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E -E which means pulling the, the meaning out of the text. Um, those were, when my last Bible study, you heard the difference. A lot of people are into eisegesis, which means infusing God's word with what they think. They're telling God how he should act. They're telling God what they're willing to believe. Exegesis is, regardless of what we think, is saying, but I'm reading this, so I'm having a struggle. Because apparently this is what God thinks. Years ago, I had somebody who left our church angry and upset with me um, and said, well, I think, I think, I think. And I always come back to God's word. And, I, and lovingly, I just said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. At the end of the day, it only matters what God thinks. And God's thoughts can only be found in scripture. God is not to conform to us or to our culture. It is we who are supposed to conform to God. So it's important in doing our studies, we really seek understanding. What is God really trying to stay, uh, you know, through this? All right. So um, uh, in exegeting a passage that we determine whether it's meant to be historical, the Bible is not linear. There are many different styles of writing. Some of it's prose, you know, some of it's historical, uh, some of it's poetic, you know, like the Psalms. A lot of people like the Psalms because it seems like there's a lot of angry Psalms, a lot of sad Psalms, and, and a lot of people is like, God, they hurt my feelings, smote them. You know, it's like, okay, that I can identify with, I can find that, you know. But it's actually meant to be poetry, um, uh, not, not as much for exegesis, uh, but understanding the style of the writing. Uh, there's hyperbolic, um, where we get the uh, word hyperbole. Um, and I used a couple of them here. <laughs> so if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Okay, if you say, well, I follow the Bible. Well, you must not because it says we've all sinned and everybody should have cut their hand off by now. Uh, cut their, pluck their eyes out. It's like, no. That's not what he really wants because your hand can't cause you to sin. It's your heart. All right? So we need to know if it's hyperbole. Um, we used that illustration last week with um, uh, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Did he really, God really hate people? Um, there are many people who have heard that verse and said, wow, God is a whimsical, a whimsical, a capricious God, and I just can't serve a God like that. He's mean and he's wicked and he's nasty. And they walk away from the faith. What they don't understand is they don't understand God at all. And they don't understand his word. And they don't understand context. And reading it all together rather than... It, you get dangerous when you make a doctrine out of one passage. Okay? Um, uh, so I used some of the explanation of, of hyperbole. Uh, to explain that it was more of a preference which my preference would have been if they had interpreted it preference and not hate um, but point being there's good reason to understand it to be preference 
and not a whimsical God who just hates. All right. Um, uh, or or is the is the writing meant to be literal? Or is it metaphorical? Is it metaphor? This one is metaphorical. <laughs> That's why a lot of preachers wear closed-in shoes. They have ugly feet. But when he's saying how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, he's not saying, look down, 10 perfect toes, you know? He's like, like no, no, just saying the, the, the gospel is beautiful. The good news of God is beautiful. And people love to see these people coming. Um, so this one's metaphorical, a uh, little bit tongue-in-cheek and humor there. But to help you understand, it's God's word, the good news that brings peace and salvation. And that is a beautiful thing. All right, number six. In uh, verse 17, Paul indicates uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in Paul's days, scrolls had to be hand copied. Uh, there just weren't a lot of them to go around. People didn't have a bunch of scrolls at home that they could read by the candlelight at night. Most learned God's word by listening to a teacher or rabbi. Um, today, we're blessed to have our own copies of the Bible. Um, the, gospel, the gospel is powerful. It is the power of God to save souls. We've heard testimony after testimony um, with our Gideons just saying, we happen to know uh, by our statistics that out of every 100 Bibles we give out, and I don't remember the number, but I'll say 10%, we know we're going to give their lives to Christ. How many times have we heard somebody say, God, if you're there, I need to hear from you, sitting alone in a hotel room about to blow their brains out, but something says, pick up and read, and they open God's word, and it changes everything you know, for them. So there's power in God's word, power to save souls. Um, Personal reading is imperative, I-M-P-E-R-A-T-I-V-E. -E. Um, it means it's a must, it's a requirement. You must do that. If you uh, think you can get enough from me, God bless you, it's not gonna be enough. But if you're reading and studying and praying and memorizing God's word, I'm going to sound a whole lot more intelligent because it's already in your hearts and in your minds. So personal reading is imperative, but we are also grateful for those who preach and teach and lead and can lead us out of confusion. Uh, honestly, if I could go back to that 13-year-old boy that when I walked away from the Bible, I stayed in church. Um, but I wished I had taken it to some of my Sunday school teachers and say, help me understand this passage. I, I feel lost and I feel confused. And uh, hopefully they could have explained it to me a little bit more. A lot of people who walk away from God walk away from their own misconceptions or misperceptions about God. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And uh, somehow they get confused and think God's a mean and uh, a wicked God. Um, so a teacher can lead us out of confusion and to a deeper understanding of our faith. All right, uh, number seven. In the last part of this passage, Paul indicates that although many Jews did not believe it, it was not God who failed, but they through unbelief. The gospel is open to all. It's a stumbling block for some, but for those who believe, it is salvation now and forevermore. Amen? All right. Um, I know our time is up and some of our choir members need to run away. Let's pray, but I'm going to hang out, and if you have any thoughts or questions, I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards. Father, we come before you in this night, and we thank you for helping us to understand your word. We are grateful that it's written down. We are grateful for the men and women who have come before and who have studied uh, the ancient languages and can really help us in interpretations and help us to stay away from false doctrines, um, but to remember that you are a God of love, that you are a God of grace and a, and a God of mercy, but also a high and holy God 
that you and you alone can dictate uh, the mandate for salvation. And the only way that you have left us up to us is one way, and that's faith and trust in your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to understand this word and draw us closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody, the Lord said? Amen. Amen.